Now, we have been on a series on fruitfulness, and I want to turn it aside from today, and we want to look at what are some of the reasons why many people are not fruitful. What are some of the reasons why many people are not fruitful? And there are three main reasons I want to share with us. I'll first mention them, then I'll begin to execute them one after the other. I'm sure that is going to take us all the way to the end of the year. The first reason why people do not become fruitful is because we are immature. We are immature. It doesn't matter how much I shout, how much I pray for you, or even how much you desire to be fruitful. If you are not yet matured to the level you can be fruitful, you will never become fruitful. That's number one. Number two is if people are operating under the atmosphere of a curse. If a people are cursed, they cannot be fruitful. They may mature, but if there is a curse upon their lives, they will never bear a fruit. Number three is if they are affected by the spirit of barrenness. If they are affected by the spirit of barrenness. Those three things, I believe, are major, and we are going to be talking about them. We are going to be praying about it. We are going to be waging warfare so that every one of us is going to be fruitful in the name of Jesus. So let's begin with the first one. And this is an issue about maturity. An issue about maturity. And as we talk about maturing, we mature in various levels and in various facets and domains in life. It's not just physical maturity. It's just like in the physical, if a boy does not mature, he cannot become a father. He may have the potential, the productive organs are there, he may have the desire, but until that boy has matured, he cannot become a father. The same can also be said about a girl. Physically, we need to mature, and we all know that, isn't it? Now, in the spirit, the same also can be said. And as I talk about levels and dimensions, because I want you to understand my teaching in a, in a wholesome manner. In any level that God brings you, you need to mature in it if you are going to bear fruit. Let me give you an example. If I appoint to become a pastor in White Center, right? I give you an appointment from today, you are going to be taking care of this group of people as a pastor. Unless you mature in that as a pastor, you cannot bear fruits. Yeah. I'll give you a responsibility, but it's up to you to mature for you to bear fruits. Let's talk about a business. And I know some of you are beginning a business. When you begin a business, until the business matures, it cannot give you profit. I hear the term they use is break even. Isn't it? You break you break even. And there are businesses that take long to break even. I remember when my wife was working for a bank, she would tell me that when they are setting up a branch, they will give themselves five years before a branch can break even. So for the first four years, they know very well, we are working, no profits, but we are looking to a day when profits will begin to come. So they are working every day, they are maturing the branch. A time is going to come and the branch is going to make profits. So anything that you do is going to have the same aspect. When you are employed in a certain career, the same thing also happens. You begin as a baby, but then you have to grow, develop it. When you mature up, then you can bear fruit. On Friday, we got a new deputy president, right? He has to grow, mature for him to become fruitful. It's an opportunity. It's, he has never been in it. The other one who was there, he was given an opportunity, but some people believed he did not become fruitful. And I want you to look at life from that perspective. When you get married, now listen to this. 
When you get married, Mr. Joe, you begin that marriage as a baby. I know you are a mature man, but in terms of marriage, you enter as, as a baby. So if you don't grow that marriage, you will not live to enjoy it. You will not get the benefits and the fruits of that marriage. So as we talk about maturing, I want you to see that. Every appointment that God gives you, you begin as a baby. If we go out church planting, we begin as babies. Yes, we have sent us so many years, but for everything new we are doing, we begin as babies and we grow with it. When you develop a career, the same, and we can talk about it. So let's now look at spiritual matters. And remember this very well, that all things are controlled in the spirit. If I don't grow in my spirit, then I cannot bear fruits in the spirit. And that is going to affect every other dimension in my life. Let's begin our sharing from the book of Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 7. The way man was created, it's always good to get them from the first principle. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living being. Now, we know very well that man was created in the image and the likeness of God. Isn't it? Sometimes we wonder, where, where does man look like God? Is it the nose? Is it the height? Is it the ears? Is it the foot? By the way, where do you think God looks like a man? Or where do you think man looks like God? Talk to me. Is it? Somebody is saying in the spirit. And they got it very right. Now God does not have a physical form. God is neither male nor female. God is neither black nor white. God is neither tall nor short. God has no physical form. But he created a physical earth. That's where we live. So when he created a physical earth, he desired to create a man to come and rule over the earth that God had created. In the book of Psalm 115 and verse number 6, the Bible says, The heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. And we are the sons of men. So what God did is, he created all of us from the dust. That's why all of us look like the dust. Ebu, kwanza diangalie. See, guo, agalia mukono yako. Do you see some resemblance with your dust? Yes, if you are born from black cotton soil, you are dark like Mr. Kihara. If you, if you go to their place, you find he, he, he uh, black cotton soil. If you are born in red soil, you look like me. Or like Grace. This is red soil. Every one of you looks like the dust of the earth. And that's where we came from. That's when we, are, when we are taking you back, we say, dust return to dust and ash to ash. So physically, that is what God created. And the physical person does not look like God at all. But watch this. The Bible says, and he breathed into his nostril the breath of life. God came and put his breath into man. Somebody's breath is their life. When you die, we say you have no breath. Isn't it? Yes. When you go, we say you have no breath. So breath equals life. So we can read this way. And God breathed his life into Adam. That life is also spirit. Remember that God is spirit. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth, and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So God is spirit. When he breathed into man, he breathed into him his own life and his own spirit, and therefore man became what? Talk to me. Man became a living being. That living being is not this life. He began to live the way God lives. His spirit became alive. 
the way God lived. He breathed on him. The Hebrew word of breath is ruach. R-U-C-K. Ruach. He ruached on man. Then the Greek word for the breath of God or life of God is zoe. So after God breathed in man, he received the God kind of life, the zoe kind of life. And that's why the Bible says, and man became a living being. Everybody say that. And man became a living being. That did not go very well with the rest of creation, especially Lucifer, who was already fallen. When he realized that God had made all the investment on man, he desired to come and take it away. And that was going to happen by tempting man to disobey God who had created him in his image and likeness. And we all know what happened in the book of Genesis chapter number 3. How Adam and Eve were tempted of the devil and they sinned against God. And when they ate of that fruit, the Bible says they died. In fact, they had been told by God, the day you eat of the fruit, you will die that was the command i think it's genesis chapter 2 verse number 16 to verse number 17 eat of every tree in the garden apart from the tree of knowledge of good and evil for in the day you eat of the tree you will surely die look at this everybody the day the couple ate of that tree they died literally the spirit died. In fact, the only thing that was now awaiting to die was the physical body. Because God said, if we don't kill these guys, they are going to live in condemnation forever. And, and therefore, God had to put a mechanism where the body had to die. And the only way to keep the man from living in eternity was to make sure that he does not eat of the fruit of life that was also in the garden. Let me show you that scripture. I think it's going to be of interest to somebody. Take us the book of Genesis chapter 3. I think it's verse number 24. Let, let, let's get there. I want to hear a good foundation of this. Verse 22. The Bible says, and the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us. What does it mean that man has become like one of us? Man understood the difference between good and evil. Because the way he was created by God, he only knew good. What about this evil? The evil is that Lucifer had rebelled against God. And man was never created to be rebellious. He was created with good. That's why he was told, don't eat of that tree. Because the day you eat of it, you'll be able to tell the difference between good and evil. So God said, now man has become one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand. I'm reading from NIV. And take also from the tree of life and eat it and live forever. Look at the way God is reasoning. Now that this man has sinned, we must make sure that he does not live in his sinful nature for forever. And therefore, make sure he does not eat of the tree of life in the garden. And that's why they put cherubims, angels to guard that garden. So Adam lived 930 years after that, and then he died. But Adam had already died in the spirit. The day he sinned, the spirit died. So he was living physically, but in the spirit, he was dead. And that is why, listen to this, for you to have a relationship with God, you need to be born afresh. You need to be recreated again in God. You need to be raised up again by God. The same way Adam and Eve were created, God wants to recreate us. And the process that God recreates us is called being born again. Someone saying being born again. 
the Bible says the terms like your spirit is regenerated. Right? It was dead. When you got born again, it was regenerated. It was raised up. You became a new person when you, are born, uh, when you got born again. Let's focus on the book of Genesis, uh, not Genesis, John chapter 3, from verse number 3. Let's, let's begin from verse number 1. Just want to move slowly in this uh, part of sharing. Let's, let's, let's do it from NIV version. I seem to have fallen in love with it. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with you. Jesus replied, very, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Do you see that? No one can see. Even if you desire to see it, you cannot see it unless you are born again. Then the man is asking, how can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. Verse number six, five. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. So look at the two things he says. In verse number three, he says, You cannot see. Right? You cannot see. Now, verse number five, he says, You cannot enter. You need to see in order for you to, to enter. But even seeing, you cannot see it. That explains why many people are not born again. They cannot see what you see. They do not understand what you understand. Because their eyes are still blind. They are still dead in their spirit. They cannot see. And for the reason they cannot see, they cannot enter. Now let's look at verse number 6. Give us that in the NLT version. New Living Translation. I love the way he puts it. Humans can reproduce only humans, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So Nicodemus is limited because he's thinking about going back to his mother's womb. And the Lord is saying, if it was your mother giving birth, they can only give birth to physical human beings. But when you are born of the spirit, you are born a spiritual person. The spirit gives birth to spiritual life. Verse number 7. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The weed blows where it wants, just as you can hear the weed but can't tell where it comes from or where it, where it is going. So you can't explain how people are born of the spirit now brothers and sisters even though you are an old man when you get born you are born as a new baby hallelujah you are born as as a baby i don't know how old you are when you give your life to jesus for me i was 16 years of age so when i got born again at the age of 16 years and another baby was born in me please find out from your neighbor how old were they when they got born again how, how old were they let me see anybody who was more than 25 years of age when you got born again when you gave your life to Jesus you are more than 25 years of age lift up your hand you have one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, that's, that's quite interesting. What about Guinea Muri Murioko Kamukua Mekagapi? Let me see those who are less than 20 years. If you are below 20 years, of course I'm there. Oh, Nadio Wengi. Let me see those who are below 15 years. Ata Siko. Namutu Aseme at Shiro, you are below 15 years. Hey. Namutu Aseme at Ariza Riwa Miyokoka. 
because you are not John the Baptist. The only one who was born saved was John. He was even filled with the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. Even if you are eight years old, you are eight years mature, but a newborn was born inside of you. For me, it was 16 years. Another one may be 15. Another one may be 10. Some of the brothers here is 25. Maybe another one is 40 years. When you come to the Lord, at that point, a baby is born inside of you. Now watch this. The person who was born by Adam is always older than the person who was born by the Spirit. And the person born by the first Adam is the physical person seated next to me, smiling at me and looking at me. That is born of the first Adam. And that is the man that is dead. Spiritually, you are dead. But then, there is another one that was born of the Spirit, and that person is invisible. That person is the one who should control the one that is seated in this house. So why we come to the ministry, why we come to church, is so that we can build the inner man. We can build the spiritual person. But here is the deal. The old Adam is always older than the new man. For me, the old Adam is 16 years older than the spiritual person. If you are 20 years old when you gave your life to Jesus, the old man, the old Adam, is 20 years older than the new person. So, the problem has been, while we put efforts to grow and mature the outer person, very many of us do not put effort to grow the inner person. And as we talk about bearing fruits, we are bearing fruit from the inner person. And therefore, this new person has to be taken through the process of growth and development. First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 2 to verse number 3. The Bible says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Like the newborn babies, you have to crave the pure spiritual milk. That spiritual milk is the word of God. So when we come to church on Sunday, we are bringing that new person that was born. We want them to be fed by the word. We want them to be, to be taken care of, to be nurtured with the pure milk of the word of God. Why are we doing all that? That you may grow. That you may grow. That you may, come on, talk to me, that we may grow. So that is why we come to church every Sunday, to receive the word of God, that there may be growth, formation, increment. And what are we targeting at? Every one of us becoming mature on the inner person. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 28 and verse number 29. Apostle Paul talks about his ministry. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Do you see the word perfect there? That word perfect is drawn from the Greek word te, uh, tereos. It means one that has fully matured. One that has fully matured. What Paul is saying, every ministry that I do, whether it is my preaching, my encouragement, my rebuking, I have this one aim, to produce a people that are mature, a people that are perfected, and I want to present all of you before Christ. And I believe that is the way to measure the effectiveness of a ministry. How many of the members are growing and maturing? Physically to Kosawa, looking at all of us, we are doing well, we are growing, we are maturing, we are bearing fruits. We are having children, we are buying cars, we are buying homes, 
My main concern now is in the spirit world. You know, we are told that Kenya is 80% Christian. Are we not told that? But when you look at our lifestyle, it is not reflected as a nation that has 80% Christians. Why is it so? Because even though we are born again, we are still babies. We have not yet grown, we have not yet matured, and therefore we are not able to influence the nation. We cannot influence our country. We cannot influence our communities. But God wants to raise a people who have matured. And once we mature, then we can exert the influence that is needed in every place that we go. So that is the work. That's why I am your pastor. One of my work is to equip you, to train you, so that you can grow and mature. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 1. Let's get there, sir. Hebrews chapter 6 and, and verse number 1. So, let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Give us NIV. Let's, let's tune into NIV. I want to draw something there. Can we read together? Let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. Hold on there. Let's read that once again. One, two, three. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. That is Apostle Paul. He was looking at the church in Hebrew and he realized the people had remained at the place of elementary doctrine. The very basic things. And when I look at the church in Kenya, that is where we are. What are some of the basic things that God is saying we have to go beyond them? Things like just pursuing God for a blessing. Yeah, in fact, most of us go to church for a blessing. Many people go to church for a miracle. Many will go to church for what God is going to do for them. Well, that is okay. I want you to know that God will still bless you even if you don't come to church. That's a risky statement to make as a pastor. But that is the truth. Even if you don't come to church, God will still bless you. God will still heal you even if you don't do anything. Even if you don't give, God will still bless you with money. Even if you don't tithe, God will still do everything for you because he is your father and he supplies for you. And that's why we should not be preoccupied by those simple things. Paul calls them the elementary teachings. Someone say elementary teachings. Yes, just hearing every day God will come through for you. God is about to locate you. God is about to lift you. It is true, it is good, but it is too elementary. He knows where I am. He knows where I am. And he, he knows what I need. And he will surely come. But Paul is saying, let us now move from the elementary and let us go on to maturity. Let us go on to what? To maturity. That is where we are going to bear fruit. Even if you have all the blessings, you have all the things people are looking for, unless we mature, we can never become fruitful and that is why as a pastor i am asking all of us let us take a journey and this journey is a journey to maturity amen in everything that god has given you take a journey to maturity every appointment god gives you take a journey to maturity when you get married take your marriage on a journey to maturity when you begin a business, begin a journey to what? To maturity. Don't rejoice about your job forever. I heard somebody say that one of the challenges we encountered in Africa is that when we got independence, we over-celebrated. We forgot to build our nation. I think the country that got independence when I was an adult was South Africa, 1994. When Nelson Mandela shook hands with the, uh, was it called Pick Bother? And out of that, they got independence. Now, history has it 
that up to today, there are still some South Africans who are still celebrating, singing Mandela songs. They are forgetting that they were given independence so that they can begin a journey of developing their nation and developing themselves that they can mature and be able to have, to have self-governance. So for everything God gives us, we have to take that journey, the journey to maturity, because it is until we get there that we are going to mature. 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 1 to verse number 3. Let's go to NLT. NLT. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter number 3. 3, that is 13. Higher. Watch this. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belong to this world or as though you are infants in the Christian life. This is Apostle Paul. He is a pastor of this church in Corinth. Because of the level of investment he had made in their lives, he expected that the believers would have grown and matured. But every time he came among them, he realized he was not able to engage them as a people who had grown and matured. And he said, I, I couldn't speak to you as to a spiritual people. I had to talk to you as if you still belong to the world or as though you are infants in your Christian life. It is possible, brothers and sisters, for you to be born again but to stagnate. Stagnation is a reality in the Christian life. So that even though you say I've been born again for 10, 15 years, in your spirit, you have not yet grown. You are not maturing in your spiritual person. And that's one of the frustrations that most of us are having. Because you see people getting born again yesterday, and within two years, they are bypassing you. And you think it is as a result of pride. It's not always pride. It is you who stagnated. And so even when God comes to you, he cannot deal with you as a mature person. He is going to deal with you as an infant, one that has not yet matured, even the way he engages you. That's what Paul was saying. Verse number two. I had to feed you with milk, not with the solid food. All of us know that when you have a newborn, you give them milk. In fact, you begin with the breast milk, then you give them cow milk, then after that you introduce solid food. That is what Paul is saying. In the ministry, we need to have the same. We begin with milk, we go to formula, then after that we introduce solid food. If you don't introduce solid food to believers, they will remain as infants. Unfortunately, very many believers do not want anything hard. Anything that does not say pokea, they don't want it. People want their miracle and they want it now. And if you tell them to wait on God, they are saying, no, 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 I'll look for him where he is. And so for a long time, Christians have been wandering and moving from one meeting to another meeting looking for what God says I could have given you even without it. I wanted you to grow and to mature. The way to mature a baby is by introducing to them solid food. Someone says solid food. And we pray that as a ministry we'll be able to introduce to every one of you that diet of solid food. And as we bring the food, please be ready to eat the food. Enjoy the food because that is the only way that you and I are going to grow and become what God wants us to be. Let me take five minutes of my time, of your time, and define maturity. How do you know that somebody has matured? And, and by the way, I think next service, I'll just continue from there. I will not recap because I realize I have too much to share. Number one 
is when one becomes perfected in Christ. One becomes perfected in Christ. That's how you get to know that someone has matured. Maturity is not measured by how many years you have been born again. As I stand here today, I am counting 33 years since I gave my life to Jesus. Actually, my birthday was on the 30th of October. That was on Friday, no Thursday. That's when I clocked 33 years. Since the day I knelt down. The question is, is that a measure of maturity? Talk to me. Can that be said to be a measure of maturity? Not at all. I can be 30 years as born again, but I am still a baby because I have not yet been perfected in Christ. I have not grown to a place of perfection. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 48. The Bible says, Therefore ye shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. In other words, God is saying to me, I appreciate that you are 33 years old in Christianity. However, you shall be perfect just as your heavenly father is perfect. When all of us get born again, we are born as babies at a place called imperfection. Right? But as we begin to walk with God, as we are being fed with the word of God, as we are receiving solid food, we come to a place where we are perfected. That word perfected also means a complete person, a mature person. Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11 to verse number 13. The place where we find the fivefold minister, the fivefold ministry. The Bible says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, verse number 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Look at verse number 13. Let's go to verse number 13. Till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Keep your eyes on that verse. This tells you what your pastor should do to you. My work is to equip you, to train you, to feed you, to pray for you, to challenge you, so that we can all come to the unity of faith. Someone say unity of faith. Unity of faith means we believe the same thing. Hallelujah. We believe the same thing. Because we can be in a church and everybody believes their own theology. Everyone believes their own thing. But after we listen together, after we hear the word of God, we come to a point of unity of faith. And that is why the Bible encourages us that we should not miss the coming together of the church. When we come together, you hear the same message. And out of that same message, we can have unity of faith. Someone say unity of faith. I was challenging some people yesterday. We went for a funeral. And I found that the people are talking to the dead person. But I realized it has been a doctrine among our people. And uh, even the pastor who was correct at the funeral was also talking to the dead. And I'm going so and so, Pumuzika Vizuri, Eda Vizuri. And I realized, even though we are Christian, we don't have the same faith on as touching issues about uh, the dead. The Bible is very clear. When someone sleeps, they are gone. And there should be no communication between the living and the dead. The living and the dead. The living and the dead. But you know what happened? There was a mixture of theology and psychology. Psychology tells you, you can speak to the dead as a way of having a closure. Have you heard of that? 
There are even people who are told, go and apologize to him. Na amekufa. So you find somebody say, eh, we, kama u. Nidago tunyine besha. Nidago le hari uoya. So it's a psychology is telling you, you speak to this person because you wronged them when they were alive. And that has now become like almost a faith. And, and, and so I have to tell the people, when someone is gone, he is gone. Talk to us about him or her. All right? Yes. Talk to us. That's why even when you do a tribute, let's say, for example, you lose your mother and you want to do a tribute to your beloved mother, Bohim. when they are burying the mother, he cannot go and talk to, to the mother who is gone. Everything about the mother, he should tell us about the mother. Somebody say unity of faith. So if a church is not taught, if people do not know, you find people are going to be talking to the dead. And by the way, when you begin talking to the dead, they are going to talk to you at night. They are going to appear to you. They are going to torment you. You are going to begin to offer sacrifices. That's why sometimes it, you hear today, people are bowed by dead people. And you know in Africa, dead people have no power than the living. What a dead man said is believed more than what a living man is saying today. Because of our belief. So the pastor, your father, helps you so that you come to the unity of faith. Number two, the knowledge of the Son of God. Someone say the knowledge of the Son of God. Yes. We need to know Jesus. The Bible says whom to know is eternal life. And why should we know Jesus? He is our pattern son. Our lives are patterned after him. We want to be like him. We want to walk like him. We want to act like him. We want to handle our business like him. We want to handle relationships like him. So I need to come to the knowledge of the son of God. So when you study the scriptures, you want to know Jesus. You want to know how he would have reacted in a situation that you are in. That's why reading the Bible is a must for a born-again Christian. And in every scripture, you should be able to see Jesus. We say that in the Old Testament, it is Jesus concealed. In every scripture in the Old Testament, is Jesus. He is concealed. In the New Testament, it is Jesus revealed or unveiled. So the believers need to come to the unity of faith, number two, in the knowledge of the Son of God. Then what happens when the two happen? He comes to number three, to a perfect man. Someone say to a perfect man. That perfect man is the man in the spirit. If you look at the NIV version, it will say, and you come to full maturity. And how do you know that somebody has come to the full maturity? The next statement say, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let's say that, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is how you measure maturity in a believer. Hallelujah. Unity of faith. Knowledge of the Son of God. And then we come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So even if you got born again last week and you have the three, then we can say you are mature. And if I got born again 33 years of age and I don't have it, then I am still a baby. Isn't it? And I cannot bear fruits. You cannot bear fruits if you are a baby. And that is why my work as your pastor is to help you, to challenge you, until you come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Is it possible to get there? Come on, talk to me. Is it possible? Oh yeah. L listen to this. When we come to that level, we walk in blessings. We don't pursue blessings. Blessings pursue us. You have to decide what you want in life. Nasema, we have to decide what we want in life. 
the general Kenyan Christian is running after blessings. That's what they are running after. Some are even paying money for blessings. Can you believe it? Paying money. Planting seeds and it's a bribe. Everything. Seed. Seed. Musewangu, listen. There's a simpler way. Grow. Mature. When you come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, blessings will come looking for us. I say favor will come looking for us. We are not going to corrupt anybody. Anything people have, we are going to get it. I say you will get it. Yet you not be learning after it, not looking for it, but as you seek for Christ, in him is the fullness of all things. We believe in miracles, but we don't run after miracles. We believe in blessings, but we don't run after blessings. We are seeking the Lord, and as we get him, God is not unjust. Once you get him, all these things people are looking for, he will give them to us. He told them, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things shall be added. Yes. Mutaongezewa kama ugali sosa. Kuna mutu wariba wibo kama hiyo. We used to sing that song many, many years ago. And I want to remind us wapendwa. Tutafutani, maturity. Someone say maturity. Yes, when we mature, the things people are dying for, they will be added unto us. Mm -hmm.